Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the central questions that's being asked in Augustine of Hippo's on Free Choice of the Will, book one, is what is the cause of wrongdoing? And that requires asking a somewhat deeper question. Well, what is wrongdoing? What makes certain actions, certain behaviors wrong as opposed to being right? And there's some quite sophisticated reasoning going on in this dialogue. Sometimes it seems almost by way of digression, but it actually all holds together in one long account. So, you know, let's start by considering the three examples that the student brings up. Augustine says, well, what, what is wrongdoing? Well, adultery is wrongdoing, murder is wrongdoing, and sacrilege is wrongdoing. Now, they're going to have a, a very interesting discussion about what makes adultery wrong, and then another discussion about what makes murder wrong. They won't actually get into sacrilege as such, although we could easily extrapolate out from these principles something along those lines. So Augustine asks his um, student, Evodius, tell me why you think adultery is wrong. And one very easy way of addressing this that the student sees through right away but then falls back into is a sort of appeal to authority, human authority. Augustine says, is adultery wrong because the law forbids it? And the student says, no, no, that would be putting the cart before the horse because you know, the law forbids it because it's wrong. It's not just wrong because the law says you can't sleep with somebody else or commit some sort of infidelity. But a little bit later, he'll say, you know, I've seen people condemned for this. And then Augustine says, listen, you already said it's not the law itself, at least the temporal law, that makes adultery a wrongful act. So the student comes up with another explanation of it. And it's a quite a good one, but it doesn't ultimately work. He says, um, I know an act to be evil, which I should not allow in the case of my own wife. So Avodius is saying, I wouldn't want my own spouse to cheat on me. So that's what makes adultery wrong. It's kind of a, uh, you know, do unto others as you want to be them to do unto you, or don't do what is hateful, you know, to, to, to others, uh, what is hateful to you, you know, sort of a reciprocity, right? A universalization. And then Augustine says, that actually doesn't work as well as we think it does. What about swingers? Uh, they didn't have words you know, for swingers back in that time, but these are people who deliberately engage in, uh, you could say, a, a violation of the typical norm of committed relationships. Right? He says, if a man's passion was so strong, he offered his own wife to another and freely allowed her to be seduced by him because he wished to have the same license with this man's wife, would he be doing no wrong? And Avodius says, no, that would be wrong as well. And, you know, we might in, in our own time say, well, you know, what about, you know, consent and all that? Put that aside for the moment and just think about it in these terms. He says, that would be a very great wrong. What's wrong with that? He says, uh, Augustine says, he's not sinning against the principle that you mentioned. He's not doing what he would not like done to himself. As a matter of fact, he's all for this. So you have to find another reason why adultery would be wrong. Why a violation of a monogamous relationship involving trust would be wrong. And then Augustine goes on and suggests maybe it's something else. 
Maybe it's not whether or not it conforms to a law. Maybe it's not whether it can be universalized or anything like that. Maybe what's wrong in it is we could say the motive. What is the motive in in committing adultery? Well, you, you know, to put it very bluntly, you want to get laid, right? But you know, if we want to express that in more technical terms, uh, Augustine actually has a term that we use in English sometimes to describe this. Uh, interestingly enough, he suggests that maybe it's passion, and the word that we're translating here as passion is libido, a desire, right? It doesn't just mean sexual desire. It means, because you can have a libido dominandi, you know, a desire to dominate others, to control others. It can take many different forms, but it's a drive. It's an affect. Maybe that's what's wrong in it. So he goes on and he says, um, maybe passion is the evil in adultery. You're looking for the evil in the outward act, Um, I'll prove that passion is the evil in adultery. If a man has no opportunity of living with another man's wife, but it's obvious for some reason he would like to do so and would if he could, he's no less guilty than if he was caught in the act. And Evodius says, yeah, that's that's right. It is, it is in fact, the motive, the affective uh, motive in this case. So he says, I see there's no need of a long argument to convince me this is true of murder and sacrilege and indeed of all sins. It's plain, nothing else than passion is the principal element in the whole matter of wrongdoing. So now Evodius thinks he's gotten to the bottom of the matter of wrongdoing. It's always libido. And Augustine says, no, it's not quite so simple as that. Let's take a look now at murder. So what sort of affective shapes does libido take? Um, sometimes it's desire, cupiditas, right? Desire for something. It steers us into doing something. Like right now I have a desire to explain Augustine to you. Sometimes it could be fear, metus in Latin. And uh, fear is also an affect that has to do with, with you know, libido as well. So he says, what's the difference between these? And Augustine says, um, maybe you think it's because desire seeks its object. Well, fear avoids it. And then he says, so if somebody kills a person, not through desire, but through fear, are they doing the wrong thing? Are they still a murderer? And Avodius says, yes, but it doesn't follow that this act will be free from the motive of desire. If a person kills a, another person through fear, it's because they desire to live without fear. And uh, Augustine says, well, don't you think that's a good thing, living without fear? And Evodius says, yes, but the murderer cannot gain this by his crime. And Augustine says, I'm not worried about whether he can gain this. I'm worried about whether that's what's motivating him. He desires what is good if he desires to live without fear. This desire is free from blame. Otherwise, we'd blame everybody who desires what's good. Now things are getting a bit more complicated. And we might think of cases of self-defense or when horrible abuse is taking place, right? So he says, we cannot point to evil desire as the dominant motive in every murder. It would be false to say that the dominance of passion constitutes the evil in every sin. There might, in fact, be a murder which was not a sin. And uh, you know, Augustine makes some clarifications here. He says that you, you might you know, kill somebody, but it not be a murder. Um, and he says, you know, if a slave kills his master because he's afraid of being tortured, do you think we should count, among, we should count him among those who kill a man without actually deserving to be called a murder? And, and you know, Vodius tries to appeal to authority, and Augustine says, no, no, let's leave the law aside here. What do you actually think about this? And so they're going on and on about this, this issue of uh, whether a person who wants to live without fear has an evil desire. And it, it can be evil in, in some respects, as, as we'll see in just a bit. Um, but it's not evil in the same way as somebody who's killing their their uh, employer out of greed, right? Or because they don't want to go to jail, for example. You know, you embezzle from your employer. This is what true crime stuff is made of, right? We have the little case that unravels over half an hour or an hour, and it turns out that he was embezzling the whole time, and somebody caught him. You know, they've got the computer record, so he kills them to cover it up. Um, well, that would be wrongful, right? 
But let's say that instead it's somebody who's placed in a very difficult situation. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it's not wrong. So he says, when a master is killed by a slave through this desire not not to live in fear, he's not killed through a desire we can blame. We have not yet discovered why this action is evil. We agree that evil things are evil because they're done through passion. That is through a blameworthy desire. So what's blameworthy about the desire? Here's where Augustine is going to deepen the analysis a bit more. What makes these these instances of desire or fear bad? It's not just having desire or fear. Instead, it's a love, a more in, in Latin, of things that we can lose against our will. Things that we can lose unwillingly is another way of translating it, without, without wanting to. Well, what sort of things can we lose against our will? All sorts of, of things, right? Um, so that's going to be something that's going to guide us into realizing another insight much later on in the work after they go through a bit of a detour through discussing some other matters. Augustine asks, well, what is it that actually makes a human mind give way to desire? Um, what compels it? And the answer is nothing actually compels it. The human mind is free because we have free wills. Now, that doesn't mean things can't be made difficult for us and we can't be made to feel all sorts of passions, right? Or emotions like desire and fear. But we have a choice about whether we give in to it. He says, um, the, you know, we don't have minds that are the slave of passion uh, because of the passion. He says, um, nothing makes a mind give way to desire except what? Its own will, the voluntas, the faculty of will, and its free choice, librum, arbit, uh, uh, librum arbitrium. I almost said librum arbitri, which would be, you know, uh, uh, a different formulation. So our own choice to give in to desire, our own choice to value things in certain ways, our own, as Augustine will say later, love expressed through the will is what makes us do things wrongly. Or, you know, it makes us desire things too strongly and give in to that desire. Or it leads us into fearing the wrong things. So, so what are these sorts of things? Well, a little bit later on, he talks about this at, at a little bit of uh, length. He says, um, loving other things... Uh, more than the eternal law and one's own goodwill, which are things we can't lose, things that can't be taken away from us unwillingly. If we want to retain uh, a right will, that is a will by which we live virtuously and, and you know, pursue wisdom and uh, you know, try to live rightly and all that, it can't be taken away from us. Only our own choice to abandon that by choosing something else more can cause us to lose that. So what are these sorts of things? He says, um, people who love other things, love things like wealth, honors, pleasures, physical beauty, all the other things which they may be unable to gain, though they want them, and can lose against their will. These are what we call temporal goods. And indeed, they are goods. Pleasure is not a bad thing. Pleasure is a good. Beauty, you know, physical beauty is a good thing. Augustine actually says that it consists in a certain kind of ordering, uh, not in this uh, particular place in the text, but, but later on. Um, so he says, some men love eternal things, others love temporal things. And, um, you know, this is what makes the distinction. A little bit later on, he talks about the things that we cling to, uh, the body and what are called its goods, such as sound health, keen senses, strength, beauty, and so on. So, uh, some of which are necessary for the useful arts. Then there's freedom, although there is no true freedom except for those who are happy and cling to the eternal law. But I mean the freedom by which people think they're free when they do not have other people bossing them around. Freedom is indeed a good, and we do desire it, but it's, it's a temporal good. It's one we can lose. And if we value freedom more than we value having a good will and following the eternal law, that's when we get into problems. That's when we wind up with the, the bad sort of passion. 
He also says um, there's other things as well. Parents, brothers, wife, children, relations, connections, friends, all who are joined to us by the same bond. Human beings are, are, are good things. Even when they screw up, there, there's still a fundamental goodness to them. And yet, if we value them more highly than we should within the sort of vast matrix of things, we value them in the wrong way, we're going to get ourselves in trouble and we're going to have this, this passion that then we give into. Think about all the people who commit injustice for their children, right? We had a very recent scandal of uh, very famous people uh, committing clear injustice, which they, some of them have gone to jail for, or at least been charged with, uh, cheating to get their, stu- their, their young students into elite institutions, right? Spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on this sort of thing, right? Um, why do they do that? Well, you could say it's love of the children or maybe the prestige of the institution or fear that their kid won't, you know, be able to manage in life if they don't have a Yale degree or something along those lines, right? But they ultimately it comes back to valuing things the wrong way, having the wrong ordering of love, loving temporal goods, uh, the, the success of their children more than they love eternal goods like justice. And then everything else follows in kind of a chain. He also talks about the state itself, right? And then he says, money under which a single term is included everything of which we're rightful masters and which we are regarded as having the power to sell and give away. Any of these things can lead us away from the eternal law and from uh, our own goodwill. And when we abandon those things, the eternal law and our own goodwill in favor of these temporal goods, it is by our own choice. The passion then becomes something that we serve and are guided by, and then we do wrongful things. And that is what is wrong in these wrongful acts like adultery or murder or sacrilege. 